Little Beth Media. Hey, CG here. Welcome to a replay of one of our favorite episodes of The Rocketry Show, featuring someone who has piloted the space shuttle twice with missions STS-58 and 76, and was the commander of a third shuttle mission, STS-90. Before that, he had a very fruitful career in the Air Force, eventually becoming a flight instructor at the U.S. Air Force Test Pilot School at Edwards Air Force Base. And after retiring from NASA, he went on to do a number of other cool things, including starring in a Volkswagen commercial. Welcome, former Space Shuttle Commander Rick Seerfors. Oh, thanks. It's great to be here. You've orbited the Earth over 600 times, and the people love that. Yeah, I loved it too. But you guys hold the Guinness World Record for the best gas mileage around the world in a single trip. I'm curious, how did you do that? Well, we do have more engineers than NASA. No way. Yes, way. No, I don't believe that. I can prove it. No way. You're pooping a little space pants. No. I tell you the truth. In a moment, we'll talk to retired Colonel and NASA Space Shuttle Commander Rick Searfoss on the RocketryShow.com. Stay close. October is the time for high power in the heart of Dixie. The first annual Bama Blast Off launch event in Aliceville, Alabama, hosted by D River Ranch, Birmingham Rocket Boys, and Phoenix Missile Works. One of the highest waivers east of the Mississippi. You can launch your rockets up to 16,800 feet. Bama Blast Off features over 2,000 acres of open fields and 12,000 acres of mostly open land for recovery. On site food vendor, parking for RVs, and a team of dedicated riders on ATVs to help you shag your rockets. We've even got our own real time weather station on site. Reservations are filling up fast for the launch on October 27th and 28th. Learn more at BamaBlastOff.com. That's BamaBlastOff.com. High powered rocketry in the heart of Dixie. Sponsored by Mach 1 Rocketry. Pre register today. The first segment of The Rocketry Show is brought to you by the following patrons. Les Rayburn, Stephen Spencer, Bill Cook, Jason Cook, Gary Rosenfield, Jesse Yu, Toby Vanderbeek, Michael Pitfield, Eric Hamilton, John Beans, Charlie Savoy, Eric Gonzalez, and Tom Rum. Thanks for supporting us through Season 4, and we look forward to your continued support as we roll into Season 5, starting soon. Sequence start. Six, five, four, three, two, one, zero. All engine running. You're listening to The Rocketry Show. All right, uh, lift off and the clock is started. Yes, sir. Reading it loud and clear. If it makes fire, smoke, lots of noise, and flies into the heavens, then these guys are all about it. Here are CG, Jim, and the Rocket Noob. And boy, do we have a great show lined up for you today. And uh, joining us, our very special guest will be uh, Colonel Rick Searfoss. He is a uh, former, former space shuttle astronaut and commanded the space shuttle on a couple of missions. So he was a pilot of STS-76 aboard Atlantis, my favorite shuttle. And then, um, and uh, let's see here, he performed the third docking of an American spacecraft for the Russian space station Mir. So that's pretty cool. So that gives you a little time frame of where it was. And uh, also STS-90, he commanded a seven uh, person crew on that one. And it was a 16-day space lab flight. So that was pretty fun. A lot of experiments there. So it'll be kind of cool to talk about things there. And early on, he was on STS-58. He was also a pilot there. And um, that was aboard Space Shuttle Columbia. And that was, you know, that is my first favorite shuttle. But, you know, I kind of, my heart kind of aches whenever I mention it. So I just kind of move on to Atlantis. <laughs> but... Um, <laughs> But yeah, so he's been in space a lot of times, and it should be really fun to talk to him about his experiences. So without delaying anything any further, welcome to the show, Colonel Searfoss. Well, thanks, guys. Great to be talking with the uh, rocket guys. <laughs> <laughs> and it's great to be talking to the ultimate rocket guy that we've ever run into so far. Well, the rocket rider, <laughs> rocket pilot. <laughs> 
<laughs> we just build them. You actually fly the inside them. <laughs> so yeah, really how insane us. is that? <laughs> <laughs> it's actually pretty cool. It has its moments, that's for sure. <laughs> So we were saying, uh, we were talking, you and I, uh, I guess we met last year, um, late last year, and um, we kind of got on a, on a kick because uh, I was talking about how I was in the hobby rocketry scene before you even knew that I was doing this podcast, and then uh, we kind of bonded over hobby rocketry, mm -hmm. and uh, so you're, you're saying that's when you got your start as well, back in the day. So yeah. so what were your fond memories, and, and, and how did that lead yeah. directly into what you did later? Well, absolutely. Uh, I mean, back in the early days, um, I was 11 years old in 1967. I saw an ad in the back of Boys Life magazine, send a quarter in for this Estes rocket catalog. I go, okay. And I sent it and then I got it. And I was all worn and tattered by the time I had saved up the $6.50 or whatever to uh, mail off and get the starter kit, the little launch pad that had D batteries. And, um, uh, Three A83 engines and or motors, depending on how much of a purist you are, and um, and an Alpha, you know, built that thing, and that got me started. So I stayed active with, with it all the way through high school. Never um, morphed into the high powered rocketry later. I was also obviously very interested in model airplanes and that sort of thing, and I sort of branched off into radio control airplanes, and that's really been my hobby the last thirty some years with that. But I. I love to engage and talk to people that are into the high power rocketry and, you know, see the developments that have, that have come up. We've already come a long way from those early days. That's for sure. And you definitely have, uh, uh, now you have three, a team of three high power rocketry guys here. So we, we would love to carry on yeah. with that, that one. So, <laughs> well, I think as a pilot of the space shuttle, I think you, you qualify for a level three already. So you're, well, I think yeah, you have us be. Validate a little something. <laughs> Serendipity is a funny thing because we just got an email today in our mailbag from uh, Carter at our Northwestern mm -hmm. University. And they've just started a rocketry and space club. And uh, they just discovered our podcast. And the, he's looking at starting up a... Uh, a uh, lesson plan for middle schoolers. And he was wondering if yeah. we had any tips or what things people should teach young people about rockets. And I figured, you know what? We are here, but not only are we here, we have uh, Rick Sirfoss who took it to the next level with being an astronaut. So there is something we can, you know, share what, what kind of, it, what kind of things, uh, what do you think? That, what's your perspective? Yeah, well, I think back a little bit with my experience, uh, sharing the whole astronaut thing with school kids and the, the sweet spot I've found that really respond best to the, the message are like fourth and fifth graders. So just a little bit before middle school, I guess by the time you get to middle school, some a lot of kids I think are so jazzed by it, but they, it's perceived as maybe not so cool. Younger than fourth and fifth grade, they, you know, it's a little too young to understand it all. But if you can capture their imaginations young, and, uh, you know, and there's nothing better than seeing rockets go off. <laughs> Even the kids who don't want to be seen as uncool are going to take a peek if you come and actually fire some rockets. Um, and, and then show them, the, you know, extrapolate for them that, hey, all the science that goes into this, if you learn how to do this and get smart at it, you can get smart at a whole lot of things that will give you really exciting careers well-paying careers and make a difference in the world. I mean, I really did get a big start from model rocketry and model airplanes and just uh, inhaling everything I could get my hands on reading about, uh, you know, G. Harry Stein's book on uh, way back when, the classic on rocketry. And, um, you know, there's still that core small percentage granted of kids that are just going to go head over heels at work, but those are the ones that are going to be our future scientific leaders. and. Uh, uh, potentially Nobel Prize winners. Absolutely. Yeah, that's that's fantastic. I would say also to add to that, um, if you're starting a middle school program, um, it's it's a lot of activity. You got to keep them moving and you got to keep it fast. So yeah. you, you, you kind of, you have to trick them into the science a little bit, which is what I've noticed yeah. when I've done rocketry camps. So it's making it fun, but also peppering in a little bit of knowledge bombs here and there, but doing it in a fun way so that this, the kids stay engaged because it's right. like herding cats sometimes with the little guys. But if you do it right and do it well, then you've got them forever and they just get into it yeah. and just take it, 
many places beyond that. So it's really cool. My observation is an old gray beard is these days college students are so much more on the, up on the step and able to multitask. And, you know, they're, uh, they're much more able, I think, to come up with the kind of program that would be fast paced than if you turn it over to all the, all the guys that wore the white shirts and skinny ties in Apollo in their 20s and they're now retired and in their 60s or whatever. We're just a very different generation. Our way of looking at learning and how we do things is just different, you know. But I think it's very exciting that university students would want to outreach and, and serve these youth in that kind of way. Yeah, I'd agree with that about uh, sort, sort of tricking them into, into some of the, the science and, and the math, actually. Um, one really fun way of, of tricking them into doing a little bit of math uh, is with uh, altitude tracking. And uh, yeah. uh, you, you, hand them, you hand them something like an Estes AltiTrack, which uh, uses a little <laughs> bit of trigonometry, and a walkie-talkie, and they are all about it. Um, mm -hmm. so, uh, making, uh, so you sneak in the, the science and the mathematics and it enhances their fun. And there are, some of them are really going to, uh, latch onto that and want to do more of it. You know, I guys, I, I do a lot of corporate speaking on leadership and teamwork and so forth. Um, and interestingly enough on a few of those, uh, where clients wanted to do something more expansive than just to talk, we've put together rocket launches. And the adults just go crazy. You know, when they see in that action and that whoosh off the launch pad, it's like, whoa, this is so cool. <laughs> and we actually have, I think we know, all see, we all get that feeling still, you know, and that's, yeah, that's exactly. what makes yeah. a great hobby and, you know, and a great science. And the fact that there is a lot of stuff going on these days. Um, and I think a lot of it has to do with like, I'm seeing a lot of second generation rocket rocket guys coming around. I mean, I'm, I'm 50 mm -hmm. myself, but, um, but I see a lot of the younger guys that are coming up are actually like, were inspired by the space shuttle, by, you know, by people like you that flew yeah. it and stuff, you know? So it's kind of nice to see that. I work at a high school right now and I've got a rocket club and a TARC team that I just started this year. And it's, it's really amazing to see how these guys are into it. They're all watching the stuff about SpaceX. They're all watching like what's going on with that yeah. or the launch. They're all watching all the videos and stuff. And it's kind of cool to see because it's almost like a, like a second golden age of, of commercialization of space, which we've talked about in previous shows, but we're seeing a lot yeah. of that now. And it's kind of, it, it's kind of, reassuring to me as an old school rocket guy that, that it's, it's alive and it's just changing a little bit. And if you adapt to it, you can keep it going, you know, and not, not just for the hobby, but just for the kids and the next generation of, of what will make our country great with good, you know, leaders in engineering and science. Yeah, totally concur. Besides, it's fun. <laughs> yeah. It's a lot of fun. <laughs> that's, that's the most important part because if it's not fun, you don't learn anything. Yeah, hey, Rick. I have a, a question, if I may. Um, this was a question that one of the guys on my my my, my TARC team has wanted to ask because I told them we were going to be talking to you. Um, okay, Mr. Roby, this one's for you. He wanted to know, did you ever have any fears of a pressure suit um, having a leak at some point or some kind of anomaly happening while you were orbiting? I wouldn't say fears. I'd say you do spend an awful lot of time uh, sweating the details in the training and <laughs> sure. making sure you're up to speed and uh, making sure that if something does go wrong, it's not your fault. <laughs> That's <huge important. laughs> right. <Yeah. laughs> um, I did not ever do a spacewalk as a pilot astronaut. Um, so, you know, putting one of the white EVA suits on is not, and going out doors is not something that I did. Um, but still the pressure suits that we wear, if, you know, if you do have a massive deep press going on in the, in the cockpit, uh, you'll be glad you had that. Um, and just like any other emergency procedure, I've done a flying Air Force fighters or the test pilot or you know, flying, actually flying the shuttle, you just train, 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 know your stuff, practice it backwards and forwards, and uh, and then you have the confidence to go. I mean, you mitigate the risks as best you can. You recognize there's still risk there, and you sure you have some emotions and there's certainly fear in the back of your mind when you go fly. But I never had, I never was uh, worried about a piece of a certain piece of equipment failing or, or things. I just said, you know, we're as trained as best we can be and we'll just have to deal with anything that might happen. And we did have a pretty significant launch emergency on my second flight. Uh, the reason 
you probably never heard about it is because it, 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 we all handled it the way we've been trained. That's a good thing, you know. <laughs> when <laughs> right. Gary Leninger went up and had the fire on the Russian space station Mir, um, mm. you know, the Russians sort of have a different approach to a number of safety-related things than we do, and <laughs> and that you know became very dramatic. And we we heard about it because it was uh, let's just say the Russians have a different approach to uh, some uh, emergency training and preparation than we do. But on on back to STS seventy six, we have this massive hydraulic failure of one of our three systems. Um, and I just took care of the procedure like I've been trained, isolated the leak, all that on around the pressure suit under three Gs of acceleration, so three times my nor- normal weight, and got to orbit. And I realized that, like, wow, while that was going on, I was just another day in the office. I was just responding the way I'd been trained. And then after the heat battle was over, so to speak, and time to think about it a little bit, then the heart rate went up, and it's like, <laughs> Oh, I'm not in a simulator now. This is the real deal. You know, good thing I didn't screw that one up. You Just know. taking care of business. <laughs> That's funny. Yeah. yeah. But it's thanks up to all the training. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. So how long did it, like uh, the typical training, um, what kind of a regiment would that be? How many years and just for, to be uh, like a commander of a shuttle mission? Yeah. Well, in the, in the shuttle era, yeah, of course, and I'll just speak to the pilot astronauts, the one that ones sure. that are actually in the front two seats as the pilot or commander. Uh, all come from a military test pilot background, so all have, I mean, a minimum of ten years, typically more, of uh, high performance jet uh, time. Typically, fighter pilots or attack pilots in the Air Force, Marines, Navy, and then there are also test pilot school graduates. So that's another. Uh, Year-long course, you have to have an engineering background even to attend test pilot school because it's a combining the top end flying with the engineering. And then experience in flight test after that school. So that's just an entering uh, requirement. <laughs> and once you get in the program, uh, you don't. your first year in the sh- uh, for a shuttle astronaut class is all the generic training and you're all together as a class, and you, not a lot of that time is actually in the shuttle simulator. It's just all of the, basically everything you need to get to the point where you can keep up with crew training in the simulator once you're assigned to a crew. Uh, they get you past that point. They design, NASA designates you as an astronaut, but I tell you, I never felt like I was a real astronaut until I'd actually flown a mission. <laughs> you know, that was their designation. And then they farm you out to do technical support jobs where you're learning all the time and you're but your job at that point is not to train for your own mission. It's to support other missions. And I had some great times doing a variety of different technical assignments, they're called. Uh, and it all helped get me ready to go fly in space. I mean, particularly the job I had down working is kind of like a liaison officer uh, at the Kennedy Space Center. Uh, so I was down there all the time. And yeah, spent a lot of time on vehicles and launch pads, doing switch lists and setting things up, and uh, the airlock air, airlock closeouts and uh, spacesuit checkouts and helping strap crews in for missions. And that was a very busy time in the shuttle era as well. So there was a lot going on, and that stood me in great stead when I actually got my own mission assignment. And I was down there; I was the one being strapped in, not doing the strapping. <laughs> so uh, how did so how did that, that feel like? Behind it, <laughs> Yeah, at some point they tack on the shoulder and say, "Hey, you get a chance to go fly in space now, you know." And then you start the training, uh, which is the template was typically about a year together as a crew for a shuttle mission, and uh, it ramps up so that by the end of that time you're working, you know, ninety, hundred hour weeks. It's just nonstop, and your nose is in the book all the time. Even when I was home, you know, eating dinner, I'd be studying, and, and my wife and kids were very accommodating. They understood. What was what, what was necessary, especially for the first time as a rookie flyer, you know. Um, oh, yeah. Then you go fly, and you come back, and you have a little bit of time off, and time to do the NASA would send you out on PR appearances and stuff like that. But then you're right back into the cycle again, supporting other missions, and then eventually you get another mission assignment. So that's kind of your you know your life back and forth between supporting missions and a chance to actually train and fly your own missions. We'll return with more of our interview with Colonel Rick Searfoss right after this. 
North Coast Rocketry, one of the first high-power rocketry kit companies ever, takes advantage of over 30 years of high-power experience by a world-class rocketeer. You can look to North Coast Rocketry to expand your high-power rocket fleet. In addition to great kits, North Coast Rocketry also stocks lots of must-have items and accessories for every Rocketeer's workshop. Find out more about these kits and other great products today. Go to NorthCoastRocketry.com. And while you're there, don't forget to get their latest catalog, NorthCoastRocketry.com. Advanced rockets that are easy to build, fun to fly, and look great on display. It's time for Serious Rocketry. Serious Rocketry is a full line rocketry store by a rocketeer for rocketeers. They've got lots of products in their ever growing web store with fast shipping, wide selection, and courteous service. You can check out the amazing and popular Serious Rocketry kits that harken back to the days of fun to build detailed kits that are more than just three fins and a nose cone. Gene, take it away. Well, um, since we're on the NSL show, I figured uh, I was talking a lot about Q-Jets, and guess what is uh, we're going to talk about from Serious Rocketry? Ah, the Q-Jets. Um, they've got a complete stock um, and selection in-house right now. Now, the A's and the B's are in stock. The C's and D's still have to be go through a little bit of paperwork stuff, I believe, on the certification part before they're available. But right now, Quest uh, A36s and A34s are going for a two-pack for $6.39. These are amazing motors, 18-millimeter motors, composite propellant. Um, they're very, very cool. They have very unique, uh, distinctive... When it goes up in the air, a very cool tracking smoke, uh, brown smoke line thing, and it is just a fantastic, uh, fantastic model rocket engine. Uh, the other uh, set that they've got are the, uh, you're going to love this, the B46, not the B64, but the B46, <laughs> and the B44s, a two-pack of those is going for $719. And for those who want to get a bulk pack, they also have all of those um, delays and, uh, and A's and B's in uh, 25 packs, and the 25 packs of any of those is going for $71.99. That's an amazing deal for QGIS. I love these little motors. I think they're awesome. Go for it. Cool. Excellent. Serious Rocketry's website features real-time stock tracking, which, let, which lets you order with confidence from their online store. No having to call or write to see if something is really in stock. When you're ready to fly, Serious Rocketry has motors and hardware in stock and ready to ship from SDs through Aerotech High Power. You can ask them about their club specials, and you can always uh, rely on serious rocketry and business since 1998. And you can visit their website at siriusrocketry.biz and .com. Serious Rocketry for the Serious Rocketeer. Introducing Mach 1 Rocketry, the creators of a new line of fiberglass kits with amazing designs and solid construction that'll last a lifetime. Mach 1 Rocketry, the fiberglass specialists. We don't make anything else. Now you can fly low power with less worries about crashes and wet weather. Check out our BT size kits with filament wound airframes and 1 16th inch G10 fins and G10 centering rings. These rockets are tough enough to take the punishment of many flights. And when you're ready to step up the high power rockets. Mach 1 Rocketry has a complete line of exciting new fiberglass kits. Check out old favorites and great new designs as well, like the Black Hole, an instant classic. Easy to build, tough, and inexpensive. The triple crown of rockets from Mach 1 Rocketry, the only manufacturer of fiberglass BT sized rockets in the world. Visit us online at Mach 1 Rocketry.com. That's Mach, the number one, Rocketry.com. Kits and by flyers for flyers step up today the second segment of this episode of the rocketry show is brought to you by the following patrons johnrocket.com joe s paul olivieri david simmons sam feinberg michael aylward brian schenkenberger john k e hudnell john thompson mark mcbride doug wade c mccauley the piedmont student launch team steve s and timothy hoagland Thanks for supporting us through Season 4 of The Rocketry Show, and we look forward to serving you more as we start Season 5 coming soon. Welcome back to The Rocketry Show at therocketryshow.com. We'll now continue with more of our interview with astronaut Colonel Rick Searfoss. You know, a lot of people have 
some vague idea of what it might be like to be an astronaut. But a lot of these are misconceptions like astronaut ice cream and tang and you know, <laughs> pens, pens that write upside down or <clears throat> what have you. Um, so yeah. uh, before you became an astronaut, um, were there any, was there anything that you thought it would be like that turned out to be completely the opposite or what, what was completely different once you got in the space program from what you were expecting? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I'll hit that, but I do want to answer those three specific things you mentioned real briefly. Uh, so astronaut ice cream, we don't eat it. We just sell it to the tourists down at Kennedy Space Center. Uh, <laughs> Tang, I love it, but uh, we have a wide variety of different powdered drinks on the show. Not just <laughs> orange, but mango, grape, and cherry, whatever you want. It's all mango, good. Tang. And then, <laughs> Yeah, yeah, and then the whole Fisher Space Pen, uh, that was a private development by a guy named Mr. Fisher. I actually met his son last year. He he spent about $100,000 of his own money developing this thing, and there's a meme kind of floating around the Internet saying, well, you know, NASA spent a gazillion dollars with this pen that could write in space, and the Russians just write with a pencil, and ha, 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 and some poor better. And they go, well, to begin with, NASA didn't spend a single penny. And Mr. Fisher, uh, by the marketing value of what he did, has made far and away much more money than the $100,000 he put down for development. <laughs> so it's a great classic case of seeing a need and filling it, which is why the American capitalist system is so much better than the Russian system. <laughs> so uh, obviously I'm showing my stripes as a retired U.S. Air Force guy, very patriotic American. Um, but, in, but enough of that. Things that surprised me coming into the program. Uh, there weren't actually a lot of surprises. Um, but in retrospect, looking back at it, um, the thing that I evolved with that kind of surprised me is how much more of a human thing it is than I first anticipated. Because I came from, okay, military pilot, test pilot, you know, I'm going to get to fly in a space shuttle, Roger Houston over and out, so you see on all the movies and everything. But there's plenty of room because even though we take our job really seriously, we don't necessarily take ourselves too seriously. I mean, there's plenty of room for humor, even some practical jokes. Uh, the the whole range of emotions that you experience just getting ready to fly in space and then flying in space. And then, you know, and unfortunately, too, the, the tragedies. I, you know, when we lost Columbia, I lost uh, some very good friends, you know, and Rick Husband, the commander, had actually worked for me for a time in the astronaut corps. We had been test pilots together at Edwards Air Force Base. So that whole, in the balance, looking back on it in retrospect, as much as I love the technical and a chance to actually fly in space and have that, the emotional human side of it was just incredibly enriching as well. Uh, and then the spaceflight experience itself is emotional. Just to look out the window at planet Earth and see, you know, that's, wow, that's my home down there. And so home with some 7 billion of us as we hurtle through the cosmos. It's, uh, you know, you'd have to be a robot not to have some sort of emotional reaction uh, to that. But, you know, generally speaking, you keep, keep that in the back of your mind while you do your job and, you don't diffuse over it too much because, you know, you're not an actor up there. You're not a poet that's there just to savor the emotions. You're there to get a job done, you know. So, but but that was a very pleasant surprise to me in the balance of how enriched I felt my life was from every bit of the experience during the nine years in the astronaut corps. I have a couple of questions there. Now, being in space, like every astronaut has some takeaway that, that they have that they want to relay back to those of us who've never been there. So being mm -hmm. in space, what's the one thought that you wish people would be more aware of, you know, um, from your perspective? It, yeah, it would be an awareness. I mean, you know, I don't, and I don't put rose colored glasses on. I see the world and know what it is. And I can be a very practical and downright military kind of guy, you know, <laughs> that's my background. <laughs> However, having said that, I mean, if, if you've gone around the earth, in just 90 minutes and seen every continent during that span of time and looked out on, on our home, you recognize it really is our home. And you go like, you know, really, we ought to do a better job of getting along together because we're all in this together out in the vastness of space, you know. Um, but I recognize that we're also all humans with our weaknesses. And I mean, and, and I very much recognize there's evil in the world and there's, um, 
many, many less than optimum situations or, or even people in the world. I mean, that's just the reality we live in in mortality. But uh, I think if everyone had, had experienced what the space flyers that experience, so we would have a, a better overall perspective in the world, and I'd like to think it would be better. Another component of that, too, is um, I actually am quite an optimist uh, when it comes to looking at the state of our planet ecologically and where we're headed. You know, I am not a doom and gloom naysayer. Um, the um, I, I think the data supports that in, in many, many ways. I mean, listen, shoot, in your neck of the woods, just look at the Cuyahoga River when it caught on fire in the 70s and how cleaned up it is now and so on and so forth. And we, by taking proper and better stewardship, we've made just great progress along, along those lines. Uh, I don't subscribe to the, to the meme either that, um, you know, we're all going to be inundated with rising sea levels and that uh, global warming is the biggest threat facing us and so on and so forth. I don't subscribe to that at all. I think the data doesn't prove that. In fact, I outright think much of the data has been manipulated by people with political agendas. Uh, speaking as a very data-driven guy who has to analyze data properly or I could die when I'm test flying. For sure. Uh, that, really, <laughs> Good that kind of thing, when and if it happens, really disturbs me. Um, I think intelligent people of goodwill on any side of a scientific uh, discussion can can have a reasonable, rational discussion, but it's that's hard to have when uh, ideology jumps into it. But again, just intuitively or just looking at the great vastness of our planet compared to where humans are and uh, the, the general state of improvement over the years, filtering that in, I'm an optimist. And, do we still have challenges? Absolutely. Do we do we still need to be better stewards? Sure. Can we do that? Absolutely, because we're humans and we are the innovative species. Uh, so let's give that innovation a chance to flourish, and the free market system is the best way for that to happen. So that's where I stand on all of those things, kind of tied into it. <laughs> <laughs> wow! Bam! It, yeah. And, and the other thing I've 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 heard some descriptions of it, but it'll be interesting to get your take on it. When you're going up to the shuttle on launch day and, uh, and, and you see that machine sitting there doing its thing on the pad, what, what does that feel like as you're going in there? Oh, yeah. Well, it's, it, it's like it's alive because it's got all of the fluids in it at that point and, uh, and there's hissing of the gases venting and so forth. The rotating service structure is pulled back, so you don't normally see that in, during most of the time when the shuttle's on the pad. It's all this protective structure around it but then you go out there and you're you're hearing things you don't normally hear and you're just seeing the whole thing you're seeing you know some of the gases are well, it's it's colorless but the water vapor from the cold cryogenic uh, gases as they start to vent off and um, you know boil off so to speak uh, you, you see all that it's just amazing it's like you're coming up to a sleeping dragon you know and you go Wow, this thing's going to come, come, come awake in a few hours, and we're going to be sitting on it when it does. You know, <laughs> how does it feel when the when the boosters go and the and the thing launches? I mean, that's got to be an amazing kind of a feeling, or is it just something that you just sort of just dispense with as you're getting down to taking care of what yeah, you have to well, do? No, it, it's a severe jolt. You're uh, so you're sitting there, and you feel a lot of things happening before launch. I mean, when they start the auxiliary power units up, even though they're in the back of the vehicle, you can kind of feel a little vibration going on. I mean, they're turning over to 100,000 RPM, and you know you feel a little bit of stuff coming through the structure. When they check the gimbals, they do a gimbal check a few minutes before launch, and they slam those puppies around on the hydraulics. That's a lot of mass moving around back there, so you feel that little clunkiness, you know, going on through your seat, and then. Uh, but then the main engine starts six seconds prior, and you twang, you actually move forward. And you, Commander especially gets a good view of it out to the left because you kind of spring forward, and it's like the launch pad's going backwards. And then, and you know that by the time it comes back upright again, you're going. Um, so then the solid rocket boosters light, and they release simultaneously the frangible nuts. So these, there's eight nuts that are on bolts that are about, I don't know, four or five inches uh, in diameter, uh, the hold down bolts, uh, and the, there's explosive charges in those nuts. So they go off right at T minus zero, and they blow those nuts off so the whole thing can slide off, and you're on your way. And you just feel this jolt when that happens, 
you're going 100 miles an hour by the time you clear the pad. So it's a lot of acceleration. And then at the same time, a lot of vibration. So back and forth, you're shaking, you know, difficult to read the gauges. You're just kind of like, whoa. <laughs> First time, it really gets your attention because the simulator can't quite model that. Uh, right. I mean, it does a decent job, but not in its fullness. And so you know it's the real deal and you know that there's no turning back. You know, that really gets your attention. It's got to be exhilarating. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it's great. Uh, but, you know, pilot and commander are extremely busy at that point. There's a lot of stuff you've got to be looking at over just a few second period, you know. And uh, so you just kind of keep the sensations in the back of your mind. You're strapped in really tight, you know. And then uh, the things, uh, the acceleration diminishes towards the end. They call it tail off as the SRBs uh, run out of propellant. And you're, uh, um, then it's very interesting, too. Uh, it feels like... When they separate, to me, I almost uh, I asked myself, did we have an engine quit? Because oh. the so much of the acceleration had gone away. But I'm, I'm looking at the gauges. No, everything's still working. It's just the way the real thing feels, you know. Uh, and you're still under acceleration, but not nearly as much as you were a few seconds ago. But then, uh, then it gets really smooth because the main engine just operates from the silk. There are liquids and the, the solids just, you know, just tiny little combustion they're not instabilities, but just variations in the flow internal of the engine produces all that vibration. All that goes away. Liquid propellant rockets are smooth as silk. And and then that lowered acceleration starts ramping up as you're burning mass off and also as your your uh, flight path angle comes down. You're not pitched up so high into the sky. You get more and more acceleration. So then it ramps up again to a higher level than you ever had first stage, up to 3Gs. And then the last minute, minute and a half, or under three Gs, and you're just you know, washing the gauges, uh, hoping everything goes all right, looking forward to getting the weightlessness, main engine stop, and then instantly you're weightless. I mean, it's just like uh, no time flat. It goes from three Gs to uh, zero G. I felt a little bit of a tumbling sensation for that lasted for 10 or 15 seconds to my inner ear, you know, the fluids in it kind of settled down, and then it's like, okay, we're here. Wow. And then I waited over the next really few hours to make sure, you know, I didn't want the, the old stomach to start bothering me because you don't know as a rookie. And fortunately, I had none of that. It was like, okay, I'm I'm hungry. Like, <laughs> I feel fine. You know, no problem. <laughs> cool. Let's eat. <laughs> What's wrong with yeah, you guys? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, actually, you know, as a rookie, you, they tell you to have a little something on your stomach, but not much, just in case you do right. have some of that space adaptation syndrome stuff happening. <laughs> and it really only significantly affects about a third of the people. It's not like it's super, you know, I mean, it's a significant chunk of people, so to speak. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, but it's not, you know, it's not like everyone gets it. And even the ones that do have some symptoms or stomach awareness, they either take a shot of phenogrin or take a uh, pill, and they're good to go usually by the next morning. So, anyway... Yeah, that's the whole transition from planet Earth all the way up there. Tell us about some of these practical jokes you mentioned. Oh, uh, yeah. Well, uh, <laughs> this one's kind of fun. I had uh, a co-pilot on the flight I commanded. Uh, Scott Altman was the world's biggest astronaut. He was just barely made it under the size of the height requirements and the weight requirements uh, for the pilots, you know, because uh, you got to fit in the cockpit with all the gear on and everything. He was like 6'5", or close to 6'5", and 220 pounds or so. And, but none of us on the crew reckon, realized that he was actually a picky eater, kind of, uh, until we went over to the food lab for an exercise we do during training where we go sample all the different foods they have and you take notes on the different things and then uh, and then you submit your menu choices. Well, we got into that and after like every third food, I think he's going like, ah, I won't order that. No, nah, I don't like that. Oh, this is awful. I don't want to go on. Like, how'd you get so big, dude? You know? <laughs> so I just t started taking note of that. About halfway through that exercise, I just started jotting down some notes, all the stuff he hated the most. <laughs> and then I got back to our offices, and we had to uh, submit our menus within a week of that. I call, called up the food lab and said, hey, when Scott submits his menu on, like, make it flight day 10, the evening meal, I want you to change all of his menu items to these things. It's all the stuff he hated the most. And it's all color-coded. So, you know, individual menu choices. And I said, whatever he orders for that menu, for that meal, put it on mine, okay? And then I'll 
you know, after the joke's over, I'll give it to him. So we're setting him up for this. Um, I let the rest of the crew members know about it. Uh, like that day, he said, hey, dinner tonight, this is what, this is what I got going. So just, you know, <laughs> uh, just play along, you know, and we'll, we'll see how Scott responds. So he pulls out the first thing, like eggplant parmesan. He goes, what's this stuff? I don't like this. And then, you know, <laughs> or steak tonight. Well, and tapioca pudding. I hate this. Oh, those food lab <laughs> folks. They really screwed up my menu tonight. I'm going to debrief them. And I go, Hey, scooter. He goes, yeah, boss. I go, um, uh, Gotcha. And uh, the rest of the crew just, you know, we just busted up and he goes, oh, okay. <laughs> I go, here, have my steak, uh, you know, have my asparagus. I'll follow that <laughs> no problem. You can have it. You know? <laughs> yeah. yeah. So there's, there's room awesome. for stuff like that. And I actually, I've, I've looked for those kind of opportunities or just, you know, crew bonding things, even um, from the example of my first commander, after the crew was assigned, because you don't know who you're going to be assigned in. The commander may have some insight, but everyone else is just kind of the tech on your shoulder. Hey, putting a crew together, these are the people on it, and you might not really know them too well if you hadn't been in training with them. I mean, I was a rookie. I had two other rookies on, from my class on, on that flight, so I knew those guys pretty well, but some of the other more experienced folks on it have been around the office quite a long time. I you know, just didn't really know them, but you start training and you get getting to know one another, but the very first thing that my first commander did, he said, okay, Friday evening, we'll just, uh, well, over the next couple Friday evenings, I want to go out with, you know, him and his wife with individual members of the crew and their spouses or significant others and just get to know them. And then we had a crew party within a couple of weeks to get to know all the family members because it's an important component. You're going to be spending so much time together and you're going to be doing something so intense together. Yeah, that's a good thing to get off on the right foot, but, you know, there's more to come. Stick around. We'll be right back right after these messages. It's time for eRockets.biz. eRockets.biz, your home for unique model rocket kits, as well as the world's largest selection of rocket parts from Semrock. They've been in business since 2009. E-Rockets doesn't just stock many of your favorite in-production kits. They also produce their own versions of popular out-of-production models many of you have come to enjoy over the years. Noob, what did you find that's interesting? Well, uh, I wanted to talk a little bit about the new Semrock Micromax rockets. They've got some, uh, some about six new uh, Micromax rockets. These are tiny little rockets that fly on the Quest Micromax line of motors and uh, some people really specialize in building these little little things um, they're they're challenging because they're so small but the nice thing about them is that you can fly them and they don't go too high they're really good for small fields they're streamer recovery um, you know a really high flying micromax is probably going to go 250 feet right ah, roughly yes um, and uh, some of the fatter ones go a little bit go a bit lower than that and but they're fun especially if you have a small field I mean I could go out and launch one in my you know the backyard uh, of where I live and I, I can't launch anything in the city you know but it's but they they're they're manageable but they've got some really nice, cool, new downscale versions of classic Estes rockets, such as the Bluebird Zero, which was an Estes rocket that came out in 1980s, designed, designed by the late, great Mike Dorfler. You can get the full-size uh, reproduction one through Semrock at, at eRockets.biz as well, but they also have the Micromax version, which is new. And if you, if you, you, it should be right on the front page. If you can't find it, click on New on the left-hand side. It'll take you right to all bunch, all of their new products. They're really high quality parts. Uh, they come with little fin jigs, so you get your fins on straight. A little challenging to do with a, small, a, a, a tiny little rocket sometimes, so they come with these little fin jigs, and uh, they're, they're great. They're great kits. If you've never built a Semrock kit, uh, you're gonna enjoy it. And uh, these Micromax rockets are really, really something special. There are also plenty of other new and reissue model rocket kits to choose from as well. eRockets.biz certainly has enough kits to keep you busy building rockets for a long time to come. Check out eRockets.biz today to learn more. eRockets.biz. If rocketry scares you, buy a train set. 
Let's see, 600 for motor casing, 400 for propellant, the airframe. Oh, hi, this is Gene from The Rocketry Show, and I was just adding up all the costs of one of my projects, and man, can it get steep, especially when you're looking for an onboard telemetry or GPS or tracking devices. I just saw one for $3,000, and I'm not sure about with you, but that's a lot of money for me, and I don't even know if it's gonna provide video for me. Well, that's where Insane Rockets comes in. Jason Cook has created an app available on Google Play for Android that does all of that and more. It's called the Insane Rockets app, and it provides, get this, real-time telemetry, it records video on most Android phones at 1080p, it records yaw, pitch, roll, heading, 3-axis Gs, gyro, barometer, and velocity using speech in real time. And it will even overlay your flight tracking information directly to Google Earth to help you find your rocket when it comes down. Best part of it, it's free. Go out and get it. Insane Rockets app on Google Play Store for Android. The third segment of this episode of The Rocketry Show is brought to you by the following patrons. Mark, Digit, T. Jockum, Andrew Bracken, P. Calvin, Rob Hoagie, R. Smith, J. Polman, Chad Zappa, Don J., G. Smerdin, M. Erisman, C. Tremco, J. Bryan, and Hughes LaRouge. Thanks for supporting us during Season 4, and we look forward to serving you more on Season 5 as we get to go more places and have a lot of fun and talk more rockets. Season 5 starts soon. We'll see you then. Welcome back to The Rocketry Show at therocketryshow.com. We now continue with more of our interview with astronaut Colonel Rick Searfoss. Coming back in. So what's it like um, going through reentry? I mean, for me, that would be like the scary thing, as I guess, for anybody. And then as well. um, and, as, and, and being a pilot flying the shuttle back, what's it like piloting the shuttle all yeah. the way down? Well, honestly, and of course, my last mission was before we lost Columbia, which... In, in reality, it was a launch accident that didn't really manifest itself until reentry. Right. Uh, but still, we lost the crew on reentry. Um, but I always just thought of it, you know, it's, it's flying home. Yeah, I mean, it's more significant and more challenging and dangerous than just flying in the commercial airliner. But we we understand how to do this. We, we know how to do this. But by the time I'd flown, there'd been a lot of reentries, and, you know, we had it pretty much wired. But at the same time, you, in your training, you know, all the different things that can go wrong. And they say, you know, when you're flying a shuttle trainer aircraft, there's no no approach you ever fly hardly that's set up on a perfectly nominal energy state. You're always having to fix problems and stuff. So, you, you know, you're ready to deal with that. Um, but actual reentry day was just, I mean, calm as could be because you, had, you didn't have emergencies going on like you do in the simulator. Mm -hmm. You're just, you're watching things unfold and develop. And, and the first, 20 minutes after the uh, the orbit burn, we, you know, turn around backwards and fire the um, orbital maneuvering system the engines in a retrograde sense, so opposite the direction we're going to slow us down. That's just calm as can be. You're just sitting there waiting. They call it free fall because your altitude's coming down. During that time, the commander does fly it back around, so you're pointing in forward. And then you just wait to start going into the atmosphere, and the first clue you get of that is... Uh, and the commander, or John Blaha was my commander, he held up a, a cue card, which we keep on Velcro on the eyebrow panels. He pulled it off, said, hey, watch this, Rick, and let's go of it. Instead of just floating there, it starts drifting down, like, really slowly. Mm -hmm. And even our G-meter hadn't started coming up at all. And I was just starting to feel a little bit like I'm starting to settle into the seat. And then over a period of a few minutes, you feel more and more of that. And the G-meter, you're starting to read it. You're like a tenth of a G, two tenths of a G, and then it starts coming up. And eventually it gets to two Gs because of the deceleration. Uh, the light show comes in at about Mach 17. That's pretty cool. If you're on the night side of the planet, uh, you just start seeing this pinkish-orange blow out the windows. And it's right for a pilot commander. I mean, it's right in front of you. So you get a great view of that. Uh, then you're just watching the... Not really anything to watch outside, especially, you know, um, two of my re-entries were to, uh, it was Air Force Base, so we were over the water almost the whole way back. Uh, so, you, so you don't have much to look at, and uh, my last one was nighttime all the way until a dawn landing in Edwards, so it was just getting dawn when we got all the way as far east as we were going to go. Um, so not a lot to see, but you're just, you know, real busy. Before you know it, you do... Um, 
roll out on what they call the heading alignment cone, and you are starting to look out the window for the runway and making sure it lies under your, your heads-up display symbol for where the runway ought to be. That's always a good feeling. Uh, my last re-entry was different from the other two because it was at Kennedy Space Center, and it was um, most of the re- or a good chunk of the re-entry was during daylight. Uh, the early parts of it were still light, but we landed at noon Florida time, so we coasted feet dry from the Pacific at about um, – you know, quarter to nine California time and something like that. And uh, so it was like doing this screaming low level over the United States. Just you're in these S turns, so one wing is down or the other. And depending on if you're left wing down or right wing down, determines whether the commander or the pilot gets the better view. <laughs> I remember going over like all the tan deserty areas and then things are starting to turn green a little bit. And um, we had left wing down as we flew right over the Red River and it really does look red, and, and you're pretty low at that point, I mean, relative to what you had been. You may be Red River, middle of the country, probably at a couple hundred thousand feet, maybe. So 40 to 50 miles up is all compared to, you know, a couple hundred miles up. And uh, then, the, then it's starting to get greener, and, and uh, you're seeing more water features like Mississippi River, and uh, you can tell that you're getting closer to Florida. Uh, we saw the landing site there at Kennedy Space Center over southern Alabama, somewhere over Mobile, Alabama, as we're heading down. And we were maybe 100 some thousand feet at that point. But wow. uh, just, I could see the runway. It was just clear as a bell. And I could see the, the runway and the whole complex. And I go, wow, huh. there's a landing site. Cool. <laughs> and then, uh, uh, but you're still following. You know, it's not like you're eyeballing it or anything. You're following your, your instruments and gauges. And then you keep it on the autopilot so you go subsonic just as you're in the heading alignment cone and the commander flies around and go out on final and it all happens really quick and things are just cranking right along before you know it you're stopped on the runway it's like wow we're all <laughs> back on earth that's pretty good <laughs> is it, does does it really does the shuttle really feel like it drops quickly because i've heard all the stories about it. it feels like it drops quickly but it's control drop is that kind of what it's like yeah piloting? well you don't um you're flying. You know, when you're in the atmosphere, you're flying. Yeah. So you're not getting the, uh, you know, like if you're in an airliner and you get some turbulence and you feel a stomach drop, or you go over a hill uh, in your car real fast and, and you kind of get that whoopsie feeling. You don't get any of that because you're flying at your 1G. And the, the shuttle will slice right through turbulence because it's very heavy wing loaded. So it's, it's not affected by it nearly as much as uh, lighter wing loaded aircraft. Now, having said that, we landed on the, the gustiest. Um, you know, highest gust factor day that I think was ever in the shuttle program, at least up to that point. Uh, we were about four knots below the crosswind limit, which was fine there, but it was gusting. It was going, you know, like four to, uh, to 11, four to 11, you know, just back and forth. Mm-hmm. So we definitely felt some of that in the shuttle, and it doesn't respond like a normal airplane, just sort of heaves and feels a little different. But that was only very close into the ground the last little bit. Um, but, you know, just kind of, motor on through that or you don't motor because there's no engine going but you just uh, <laughs> fly on through that and then you touch down um so but it, it, it handles so very the shuttle quite. is it's a lifting body correct because i've yeah yeah, I've seen yeah some with maximum the maximum lift to drag ratio um is which is the glide ratio uh is about four to one so one foot down for four foot forward that's a whole lot steeper than uh, your typical commercial airliner um which on on final is about a three degree glide slope, and the shuttle is about a twenty degree glide slope. So, with the nose down that that steep, obviously you've got to pull it up and you set up for the landing slope. But once you start in the pre flare at two thousand feet uh, above ground, uh, from then on you're decelerating all the way. So you go from three hundred knots indicated airspeed all the way down to touchdown right around two hundred knots. Uh, so you've lost that in the whole way as you're as you're decreasing the flight path angle and. and Preventing a crash, in fact, and getting to where it's landing. Wow, cool. that is so cool. Yeah. So in well, the late, in the I, late, I, I got to tell you, I got to tell you a landing-related funny story okay. that just came to mind. So I'm on a, this is years later. I'm on a commercial airline flight, um, and just about the time we landed, uh, or just before turning off electronic equipment, I look over, and the guy in the seat next to me is got an iPad with, and I look, oh, that's a heads-up display. He's got some sort of flying simulation. I go, 
So I have a gun. It's a shuttle landing simulation. Let me see. I'm watching. See how the guy does. You know, and he's he's just tilting the iPad around. That's how he flies it with the little accelerometers in there and everything. Mm -hmm. And he does a credible job. And he gets down to the end. And uh, and he puts it away. And and we land. And as we get up, I go. I couldn't help but notice uh, your shuttle simulation there. Do you want? uh, How did I put? I said. I said. the display on the real one looks about the same or some, some kind of comment like that just sort of subtle. And he goes, well, how would you know? I said, well, I, I got to actually land one. <laughs> he goes, really? <laughs> we talked for a few minutes. And I go, yeah, you did a pretty good job on that. He goes, oh, thanks. You know? <laughs> That's cool. <laughs> did you get a chance to play with that simulation? <laughs> no, I didn't because it was all put away. I was, you know, cause, um, Probably a good thing. I probably would have screwed it up, you know. And he goes, ah, you know, I actually have a shuttle simulator that I uh, tend to crash quite a bit for fun. <laughs> yeah, and actually, some yeah. of the simulators that are in various museums, um, Space Center Houston, Kennedy Space Center, they are not. I mean, they're not all that representative. And part of the problem is, in, in, I'm speaking as a test pilot here, the mechanical characteristics of the of the stick and the too. I mean, you got kids going sticky drinks on them and stuff, and they're sticky and stuff. I mean, they just don't represent the real thing at all. Not even our simulators, because you know, obviously our simulators need to be good. Mm-hmm. Um, and even the shuttle simulator was not anything close to flying shuttle trainer aircraft. It, we, we really needed to have that aircraft, that simula- in-flight simulation ca- capability to do it right. Um, but it's, it's very frustrating for me to fly some of those simulators because you'll be just get everything all lined up and then it'll it'll stick or it'll be too much lags in it. And it's just <laughs> no. not the way. It, and, and you're just trying to finesse it because you know what the real deal is. Right. And then, it, you know, it's not working right. It's like, yeah, geez. <laughs> I feel walk enough. away, you know. I have a good excuse. I guess it's good I, though because it leaves some. It, it's good from the point of view when people go and they screw it up. It leaves some sort of mystique that they think that people that actually do it are some sort of super pilots or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> it's really not representative, unfortunately. Well, you know, I, could, I hear that. I hear that Paul McCartney says that his kids are better at Beatles Rock Band video game than he is. But <laughs> they are, yeah, I bet they are. <laughs> yep. Yep. Well, <laughs> now I won't feel so f- bad in front of my friends when I do one of those shuttle simulators and I crash it. It's not yeah, accurate anyway. Yeah, just throw anywhere. out some tests by the terms. Say, uh, the lag, the lags, the processing lags are too high in this, or the, the stick mechanical characteristics, there's too much stiction in it. Just use some terms like that and I'll go, oh, dude knows what he's doing, you know? <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> well, speaking of which, I, I have a question on behalf of a friend of mine without whom I, I wouldn't even be on this podcast. So my friend, Chad Rabinovitz, is going mm-hmm. to adult space camp. Do you have oh, any tips for, for him? him at, yeah, do you have any tips for him as a rookie astronaut? Yeah, be a team player, man. <laughs> I'm going to write that down. Yeah, I mean... We, oh, he's going to listen to. Uh, I, I mean, they, that term's often overused, but let me tell you a little story that ties into this. Um, It was about a week before I got assigned to my first mission, and I was walking down the hall. I'm a rookie, you know, and Shannon Lucid, who was very experienced at that point, she was in the 78 group, the first shuttle astronaut class amongst the first group of women to be selected. She came out of her her office and said, hey, Rick, how are you doing? Oh, great, Shannon. What's up? I just told her what had been going on. She goes, um, what do you think the most important thing about a crew assignment is? I go, oh, did I get one someday? <laughs> she goes, oh, well, besides that, <laughs> she goes, it's that, uh, you know, some missions are more glamorous than others, but the most important thing about a crew assignment is, is the crew you're going to fly with. She says, I've flown with two types of crews. One, you know, where everyone's like my brothers and sisters, and I just love them to pieces. And one crew, not so much. And there were, you know, just conflicts sort of personality conflicts. You much, much want to prefer, even if it's a non-glamorous mission, being with the great crew. And I go, oh, that makes great sense to me, Shannon. I'll keep that in mind. And then a week later, we're assigned to the same mission together. So I'm sure she knew, you know, being a veteran, well, she had some insight into who the crew was going to be here. Some pretty good ideas. And, and she was absolutely right. I mean, I saw it at the three great crews, um, literally my brothers and sisters, you know, and just give my life for him. You know, that's that kind of feeling. And there's nothing better than that. Uh, uh, that's the best thing ever of the whole experience. You know, even as 
as cool as being weightless or seeing the planet from that perspective, but, but doing it with people who are your dear friends, you know, that's, that's what makes it really special. And, and I'm sure, you know, I've, I've heard some feedback from people who've done an adult space camp and so forth and some of these corporate leadership kind of things that they and other groups do. And um, if you really go into it, keeping in mind, I want to get as much out of this as I can. And the way to do that is to just get to know the people, engage the outgoing, um, you know, try and make everything work together as a team. Then it's going to be so much more rewarding and fun. And and you will make some really good friends. You know, it's, it's funny how experiences like that or things like outward bound or those kind of things can really make a difference. And, and that, honestly, the astronaut corps is always looking particularly now as they're in a, in this last several years on space station on expedition mode, uh, they're always looking for ways to improve that, um, with, with everyone on the team, you know, um, there were, you can, for the subtle era, you can say, well, you know, I can kind of hold my breath for a couple, couple of weeks getting, I can get along with anyone for that amount of time. It's a whole different deal if you're up for six months together with someone, you know? Yeah. So they yeah. have actively pushed and, and trained and done these experiences, sending crews to outward bound and various different, um, analogs or sims, you know, like they've on occasion sent, uh, astronauts down to the base in Antarctica and this NEMO, I forget what the acronym stands for, but it's an underwater kind of base and looking to improve and be thinking on the human side, what it's going to take to do long, long duration space stays for, you know, ISS, moon base, maybe Mars, eventually all those kind of things. So I mean, that's tie into experience. You'll get at the adult space camp. Have some fun. All right. So you, you hear that Chad? So have fun and play nice and you'll have a great time. Yeah. Play nice. Yeah. All the <laughs> stuff you learn in kindergarten, you know, don't run with scissors, things like that. It goes all the way. And, uh, you know, I, I was big into scouting when I was a kid. I mean, I'm an Eagle Scout. I, I love scouting. And I've spoken to a lot of scout groups through the years. And I put together a presentation um, showing um, the scout law as applied in space. And all the points of the scout law. Scouts trustworthy, loyal, helpful, all of them. And I'm mean, really good at applying. And then I tell them, I said, you know where the best training that I ever got was for uh, learning to be a space shuttle commander? Or, or at least my first training was being a patrol leader in Boy Scouts and then a senior patrol leader. Now, those were my first real leadership opportunities. And then, of course, I had a lot of training for the Air Force Academy and as a military officer and so forth. But uh, um, Start somewhere. the human side of it's just so crucial. That's really cool. And that's, that's a life lesson. That goes through everything that you do, you know, yeah. could, any, and, and any I, career. I alluded to it a little before, but I'll, I'll put in my shameless marketing pitch now, <laughs> if that's all right. Awesome. <laughs> I, I, I do do a lot of speaking to corporate audiences on leadership and teamwork these days. And I, I think it's a pretty realistic model because of all that's involved and how dynamic it is to get a space shuttle crew ready to fly. And then all the people you work with, the support folks and so forth, the whole team and the leadership role that the commander plays. It's so instrumental in that. Um, that I've, I mean, I've had a great time doing it the last uh, dozen years or so. I've spoken to Fortune 500 companies, many, many, many of them. Every continent except Antarctica. The penguins aren't willing to pay my fee, I guess. I don't know. Um, <laughs> but I just it's that leadership, that human side that I talk about. And uh, you know, RickSirfoss.com is just my website. Those that might be listening that you know want something a little bit different from the normal run-of-the-mill corporate meeting. Um, get leadership from someone who's been in space. I'd, I'd definitely do that if I was a Fortune 500 CEO, <laughs> but I'm not, unfortunately. <laughs> well, <yeah. laughs> maybe some of your listeners. Yeah, uh, true. <laughs> the so, club that are that book speakers who are also uh, rocket geeks. I don't know how what the intersection might be, but uh, I'm always looking for opportunities to speak. <laughs> Absolutely. Because, it, well, it sounds like you have a passion about that. And, I mean, what better place to, to show passion than on this show? Because this is all about passion and hobby and, and, and yeah. why we do it and what Absolutely. we do and how we do it and, and all that stuff going. So, it's, um, yeah. it's a good medium to do so. Have at it. Yeah, Absolutely. They've got a, a couple of uh, last-minute questions coming in from... Uh, one, a couple from my stepdaughter, actually. Um, 
and she's wondering, maybe you're the bad, bad person to ask this question about since it didn't really affect you, but she's wondering, is it true that motion sickness is, to quote her, like 10 times worse in space? You know, I wouldn't call it 10 times worse. In fact, most people that have any symptoms at all, it's just you know, mild stomach awareness and this medicine, fenugrin that they've used, it's just absolutely 100% track record taking care of it. The thing about it that's it's kind of weird is it's, still not thoroughly understood. We've had people, you know, I mean, died in the world fighter pilot type astronauts who've never been sick in an airplane who have challenges with space adaptation syndrome. Likewise, we've had, you know, maybe mission specialists who put them in the back of a T-38 and go pull a bunch of Gs and so forth. They have a little problem keeping their cookies down, but they have no issues at all in space. It just doesn't exactly correlate and it's still not fully understood. Operationally, though, it's like, doesn't matter because we got the med- medication, and uh, those that need it take some, and they're good to go. Um, and, yeah, so it's not; it's much overblown. I, I find people think it's much more of an issue than it really truly is. Um, and granted, not having ever experienced it, it's not like that. I had a lot of empathy. If I, I did have one or two crew members when I was commander who had a few symptoms, you know, nothing serious with anyone, but makes you feel a little green behind the gills. And so they had to take a little easy, get the fenugrin down, and then, you know, be good to go. Um, so I like to think I, as commander, I empathized with them. But on the other hand, we had a job to do. It's like, okay, take your med- meds and get back to work. <laughs> <laughs> got stuff to do. <laughs> and, and the other question, we got quite a few of them from the mailbag here over the last few months, was um, what happens to the human waste? Oh, I, oh, uh, well, of course, on space station, um, because water is at a premium, they recycle the urine, and you know it's no big deal. I mean, our whole water cycle on Earth does essentially the same thing. You know, of course, we help it along with processing of human sewage and so forth. But uh, in the shuttle, we did not do that. We had a, we actually produced more water than we needed because the liquid hydrogen and uh, oxygen that we carried up cryogenically in tanks. Um, the power of the fuel cells then produced very pure water uh, from that process of, of fuel cell power generation. And then we used it, we just piped that over to the galley and we had all the water we needed. Um, so because of that, we didn't need to conserve the urine or anything or the humidity that was separated from the air and that moisture. It all went into a wastewater tank and we dumped the excess water out into space. Um, you know, typically in a it's like a two week long shuttle mission, you'd have a couple wastewater dumps, maybe three. And um, actually, that's a very pretty thing to see. Yesterday's urine going floating off into space because <laughs> it's, it's in the wastewater tank, and the the nozzle, the the plumbing, and the nozzle that go out to space, the you know the mold line of the vehicle, it's all heated, so nothing will freeze while it's in the line. But as soon as it uh, sprays out uh, under pressure into vacuum, uh, it it crystallizes, you know, and it freezes, and you've got these ice crystals going going away. And depending on the lighting conditions, if it's against the black the black velvet of space, and you've got the right lighting shining on these ice crystals, it's like diamonds being thrown up against a, a velvet uh, background or something. It's very, it's very pretty, you know. So yesterday's uh, soft, <laughs> hot drinks and tang, you know, uh, actually can be a very beautiful thing. Those were I've, those I've were. I've never uh, heard it described so poetically. <laughs> that, w- wasn't that the source of uh, John Glenn's uh, fireflies that he saw on his Mercury mission? Uh, it, it, he saw what he thought was fireflies following the uh, something that looked like fireflies following the yeah, capsule, and eventually. I don't, eventually I don't know out. if it was necessarily you know, water in this case. He certainly didn't do any kind of wastewater dump. Mercury was not, you know, had the duration where they needed to do that or anything like that. Yeah. And it's. And I'd have to go back. It's been a while since I've read the details on that. If, if it was that or something else, you know, from the back part of the vehicle that was just drifting yeah. along with them. But yeah. Yeah, I think yeah, if, you I, see that when, if I remember right, I think it was, I don't know if they were really fully new, but they were concerned that it was something happened to the heat shield or something. Yeah, and that, yeah, that was a big that. concern that, you know, the heat shield was not going to survive for them. And, yeah, yeah, that was a little bit of a nail biter there until he got back under in communication after the uh, hot part of the reentry. But you know, ionized gases wouldn't let him communicate. Now, on the, you're talking about the uh, the the wastewater dump. Now, that was it. 
Discovery, I think, the was it the first flight or really early on where they had some mishap happen where that actually froze right out the side of the shuttle where they couldn't use the system for the rest of the mission or something like yeah, that? Yeah, they, they, they've actually had, uh, on more than one occasion, it's it really concerned, you know, and, and you, you got, you can control the uh, heating circuits um, from the half-flight deck if I recall correctly, and, you know, you had to position them in ground control to tell you, and they would monitor the temperatures and stuff. But, yeah, you did not want to freeze up that nozzle uh, and run your tank <laughs> if your tank's full you know, of the wastewater. That could be I'm thinking what, um, I'm envisioning what would happen. And, <laughs> it's, it's not yeah, and it's a whole lot easier to keep something from freezing up than it is to unfreeze it, you know, with the heat, you know, if you got a blood block in there. And we did get a block. It wasn't uh, frozen water, but we got a little block in some foreign object or something in one of our small diameter plumbing tubes, uh, in kind of in internal, well, not totally internal toilet, but just outside of it on the way to the, uh, wastewater tank. And we had to do an in-flight maintenance thing to replumb. There's, there's backup ways. So you kind of replumb it. And I, I got to do that. The pilot and commander trained to do the in-flight maintenance tasks on the on the orbiter, and uh, my I would have gladly delegated this one for sure. <laughs> but Scooter, my co-pilot, was he was being a test subject for a pretty important experiment back in the back, and, and so they say, "Hey, CDR, I want you to do this procedure." And I go, "Yeah, Roger." Help. Uh, so I got the procedure out and uh, went down there, and uh, it was in a bit of a rush. I wanted to get it get it finished, um, so I didn't. Actually, read. I, I just glanced through the whole procedure before I started into it. But there was a note kind of just before you unhooked the plumbing. It said, "Caution: You may have, um, because of the you know residual pressure, a, a bubble of fluid come out, and be <laughs> be prepared to soak it up." And, and it advised wearing these. We call them opera gloves, but they're basically like dishwashing gloves. But I, you know. I didn't do that. I didn't want to go look for them in stowage. And I got to that point before reading that note. And sure enough, this blob of liquid comes out that's about the size of a small grapefruit. Just, and, it, <laughs> no. and it was yesterday's drinks. I mean, it was the wastewater stuff. So <laughs> right in front of my face. And I'm going, no, oh, great. You know, and the first thought came to mind is like, you know, this, this whole astronaut job's not nearly as glamorous as people think it is. <laughs> So I just, I just, you know, grabbed a towel, sopped it up with a towel, got it on my hands, whatever, you know. Um, <laughs> probably would have, wouldn't have been any different than if I'd had to unplug my toilet down at home anyway, you know. <laughs> then I just washed up afterwards, but, you know, it is what it is. And then before bed, you took out the trash out back in the shuttle. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, actually, you know, trash management is a big important thing, you know, my last flight was the third, uh, fourth longest shuttle mission ever with all the lab stuff going on. We had a lot of waste, including we had some uh, biohazard waste. I actually had a lot of it from the dissections they did and so on and so forth. They had some radioactive waste because they, uh, low, low levels because they'd done some radioisotope markings for some of the experiments in the animals. Uh, so that's special, specially treated stuff. Then we had our normal way we treat just wet trash versus dry trash. You know, it's one thing to have trash like pieces of paper, you know, when they send you a fax up and you don't need it anymore. That's dry trash and you don't have to treat that so gingerly as the wet trash, the food residue and stuff. We would uh, crush that up as tight as we could, then bag it uh, and then wrap uh, duct tape around it so we could compress it as much as possible to put it because we had a limited amount of volume that was vented for wet trash stowage, you know, and still doing that and just being as uh, disciplined as we could through the whole mission. By the end of it, we were just cramming those last little <laughs> trash balls, all duct tape wrapped up into it, just, you know, barely fitting it in and, uh, <laughs> into the space we had. And then we had others said, you know, dirty clothes and stuff, things aren't, aren't folded as neat as they were. So you, it, it's not all going to go back into the lockers they flew with. So we'd have dirty clothes and mesh bags and we'd find places to put them. It was just the whole cleanup, get ready to come back. And the, uh, the final bit, the management of all that is a non-trivial thing. It takes a fair amount of time. Housekeeping is very important. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, cool. This has been a lot of fun. <laughs> yeah. I'm it too. It's good to, resurrect some of these things 
And it's not things I think about on a daily basis anymore, you know? <laughs> I do have one small question that's probably to wrap up. We have kind of a running joke on the show about flat earthers. And <laughs> I figured I'd ask an astronaut about this who's been to space, yeah. um, you know, just to kind of clear the air a little bit. He's just Is been going around Earth... in circles on the outside. He hasn't been going around. There's no... <laughs> yeah, I tell so you, the Earth I... is round, right? <laughs> There's, you know... <laughs> I, I don't know if the net result of the internet has made has been to make the species smarter or dumber. <laughs> but some of the things you read about on the internet about things, I just saw one the other day on some space fans looking through and some guy on NASA's hiding the fact that the Earth's really flat. It's all all these missions to these all CGI and <laughs> you right. idiots. Uh, but of course it's round. I mean I've been around it, I've seen it with my eyeballs, I've seen the curvature of it, and uh yeah, and you know the whole the moon landing conspiracy folks as well. That's that's all that's been pretty much put to bed with anyone that has any rational understanding, you know. But uh, I yeah, still that laser up there, you know, that we put up there that you know we track stuff. <laughs> yeah, I, it's just, you know. it's crazy. I mean, I, I <laughs> yeah, and it's a it's a shame that uh, there are, that so many people just don't have a, I mean a basic understanding of of uh, science technology and how you would do things like that. You know, I, I had a lady, very nice lady, ask me a couple of weeks ago, so did you go to any star? I'm going, uh, no. I, I said, actually, you know, on the shuttle, the farthest I ever got away from planet Earth was still less than 300 miles away. It's in space. It's outside the atmosphere. I, I was in free fall, so I felt weightlessness, but no, the, to get to the nearest star... If I traveled much, 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 much faster than the shuttle, I mean thousands of times faster than the shuttle, to go 186,000 miles a second, it would still take four and a half years to get to the closest star. So no, you know, and I guess it, for me, I mean, that was something I knew probably in third grade, but right. that's because I was always enthralled by it. But other people have other interests, I guess, you know, but I, I just wish... In general, we had a, a, a slightly elevated understanding, real understanding of technology and science and, and engineering, if not to do engineering, at least to appreciate it uh, amongst people. But, yeah, absolutely. Um, I mean, I think you know, you're talking to, you're, you're preaching to the choir here. You know, I mean, we're yeah, all, well, I you know, know you guys. This stuff. <laughs> but it makes, but it is. And I'm, I have that same philosophy, like with my TARC team, it's uh, high school kids and we're going for this national competition thing. And it's like, I'm just trying to instill a little bit of that, you know, the internet can be one thing and it's useful and it's good and everything, but it also can be this plethora of garbage that just doesn't yeah. Yeah. make any sense to anybody. So yeah, I, I think but, that the most important thing that I think young people could, could be taught in today's world, I mean, always, but given there's so much an, an abundance and overabundance of data and information out there, the best thing that they can come armed with intellectually are criti critical thinking skills, the ability to be skeptical, to the ability to to analyze what someone's telling them, whether it's uh, more kind of humanities based or more technical based, and and come to their own conclusions. You know, do a little research, run a few numbers maybe, but. But think on their own, you know. I'm afraid uh, when we have too many answers at our fingertips, we tend to lose some of that ability. I, I see it a little bit here and there along the way. Well, thanks for joining us, uh, Eric. This is been... back, guys. Yeah, I really enjoyed our conversation. You guys uh, take care. I get back to my office for a couple more things to do before I break for dinner. And you guys uh, have a great evening and uh, stay well. Same to you. you Have too. a wonderful dinner. Okay. okay. Yep. Cheers. Thank you so Cheers. much.